Welcome to Suitable for Adults, classic children's Bible lessons retold for adults. We'll continue to look at Old Testament heroes from the perspective of the women who are often forgotten or maybe just less prominent in these stories. In this video, I'm going to talk about two more of the top biblical heroes, Elijah and Elisha. These men were prophets of God. We often tell our children these stories in Sunday school about the classic teacher and or leader Elijah and his devoted pupil Elisha who takes up his cause um, in honor of God. We learn about the chariot of fire that took Elijah straight to heaven um, and that makes for great Sunday school stories and activities. Um, the miraculous he healings, the battles that both of the men performed for God were amazing and, and classically um, told. But perhaps you forgot, or maybe you didn't hear, about a few of the women who helped them along the way. Once again, the Bible has very similar stories that mimic each other. Not only did Elijah and Elisha share a ministry and a battle, but they both have very similar stories about a caring woman who helped them along the way when they were in need. We can look at the book of 1 Kings to read about the prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings 17, we're introduced to Elijah and there is an account of his dealings with the woman of Zarephath. The Lord has withheld rain in Israel for several years because of the nation's idolatry. The part of this is a judgment because Israel was led at the time by Ahab and his wife, the infamous Jezebel, who was from a kingdom that worshipped Baal. She herself would have likely been a priestess of that faith and was so devout that she caused her husband to turn away from the one God system and allow the worship of Baal in his kingdom. And she even persecuted many of the Jews and, and killed several of God's followers. In verse 8, the Lord commands Elijah to go outside of Israel and actually into the realm of Jezebel to find a woman who will provide food for him during this drought. He obeys and he finds a woman carrying sticks and he says to her, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink and bring me a morsel of bread that you have in your hand. The widow, however, is in great need herself. There is this drought and she responds, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked and only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. Now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and we may die. She expected that this meal that she was about to fix would be her last and the last for her family and that they would not have enough to survive. Elijah's answer is often seen as a test of her faith. He told her that she was to make him some food anyway with the last of her ingredients. And he added the promise that if she did so, that all of her jars would be filled for the remainder of the drought. And the widow's faith was evident, for she was obedient and she made him the food. And God was faithful to his promise and the widow's food supply was miraculously extended as was promised, and both the woman and son were saved from certain death. Elijah stayed there for some time, living in the upper room of the widow's house. The woman's son, however, in the story later dies of an illness, and the woman is angry, feeling in grief and shame, anger. She believes that God has done this to punish her in some way. Um, even though she was faithful, perhaps it was a judgment on, on a past sin. But Elijah cries out to God. He says, My Lord God, you have brought tragedy even on the widow that I am staying with by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. And the child was restored to life. When the woman saw this, she said, 
Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. And I think this is kind of an important detail here. We often pray for miracles when bad things happen and sometimes we wonder why God chooses to heal or or to not heal um, in the circle of life. And what I find in many of the stories in the Bible is the miracles occur not for our own benefit but for the benefit of someone's faith journey. Um, it generally tends to happen when someone is making the choice to follow God or to not. And, and here we have this woman who finally decides that both Elijah is a man of God and that God is the one true God. And this is the turning point for her. The widow's faith is obviously strong enough to believe Elijah's promise or perhaps she's desperate enough, but she is compassionate and welcomes this stranger into her home and into her land. And she saves them all by doing this and giving all that she had. This story is often used as an example of giving all that you have, similar to the other widow's story that we hear more about the woman in the church who gave her last cent. Um, in the New Testament, this sort of mimics that. This is the woman, the widow's story um, in helping. And even that little gift makes a big difference. Um, so that's something that we can hold on to. It might seem odd to us, however, that though she was a faithful woman, she still lost her son. And though Elijah was a prophet, he cries out in almost an emotional outburst towards God to bring the son back to life. Um, it's almost he, he's angrier in disbelief that the son of someone he's staying with would, would be taken. Why did it take this larger miracle and not just the extension of food um, and that miraculous event for the woman to believe fully in Elijah and in God. And I think sometimes we need those bigger miracles. Sometimes it takes more than one for, for even the most faithful. We often feel once we've found faith that um, it's easy from there, that we just go and we believe, but, but really even the most devout have moments of doubt and even the most faithful, though we think that all they're going to receive is great rewards from there on out, we realize that that's not true and that we need to continually come to God in our need because it certainly doesn't end once we've found faith. There are many struggles that we all deal with um, and continue to deal with in, in our life. When Elijah rides his chariot to heaven, his pupil, Elisha, with the SH, continues his crusade against Jezebel. But he's a bit moodier and a bit more detached, having just lost his mentor. So he's not exactly as, as open as perhaps Elijah even was. Elisha was so busy and emotionally detached um, and inaccessible from anyone other than God that actually in, his, in the wake of the death of his mentor, he becomes so quick-tempered that he kills 42 children just because they make fun of him for being bald, um, which is a kind of a, a funny story that we see in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. Um, he sends bears after them and, and they are devoured. Um, but we look past this horrible scene because of the miracles that are performed, because of the battles that are waged on God's behalf, and partly because he's a man. But in his travels, he finds himself in the town of Shunem, where he meets the second woman that we will be discussing. Like many women in the Bible, she's unnamed. She serves an important role by helping Elisha when he's in need also. Second Kings 4 records an account of Elisha and the Shunammite woman. The woman is described as a great woman who is married with no child. A great woman, Isha Gedola, is usually translated as wealthy. 
And indeed, she had financial means because in the story, she builds an addition onto her house for the prophet who only comes to visit a few times a year. So this would have been, this is outlandish for us today almost. Um, it definitely would have been a large expense in the antiquity. But gedola, um, the word used in there to refer um, to greatness, can also be used for wisdom. Um, it's actually the term that's referred to rabbinic scholars who can demonstrate a high level of learning in the Torah or um, has sagacious rulings. So this woman urges her husband to set up a guest room for Elisha, acknowledging Elisha's true nature as a prophet and holy man of God. He often passed his way this way on his travels and stayed in the guest room and she persuades him to have food and water and gives him supplies that he needs. Now today, many churches have what's called a prophet's chamber or a Shunammite room um, for traveling evangelists and other servants of God that are free of charge. Um, for those in our church who hosted um, one of our missionaries a few years ago um, or other uh, people who come to visit, this would be a similar experience. It's, it's a way to host um, a man of God or someone on pilgrimage um, and just help in God's ministry through hospitality. Um, so there are Shunammite rooms still. And in fact, when I was a child, um, when my dad, who was a minister, was searching for a new church to go to, um, we, as a family, stayed in Shunammite rooms along the way. Elisha asked his servant, Gehazi, how he could help this woman um, for her he wanted to repay her for her great kindness. Um, but she declined any reward. She basically says there is no need to, to give her anything, any type of reward at all. This, she did this because God wanted her to do it. But Gehazi mentions to Elisha that she doesn't have a son and that her husband is old. So Elisha calls the woman and tells her, you will have a son by the next year. And she's in disbelief. Um, this is not something she's ever really let herself think about before. And, and she even declines it um, because she's afraid to get her hopes up that this isn't going to happen. Uh, but the prophecy is fulfilled and the woman has a child. She has a son. Now, years later, as he grows up, the child finds himself in pain and he cries out with a pain in his head and he dies in her arms the same day. She immediately leaves her home and goes to find Elisha. And what's odd is when she finds him, she says that all is well. She never claims that her son is dead. Um, instead, it, she waits until she's in his presence. And Elijah at first also doesn't know what's going on. He assumes that it's, it's a small trouble, so he offers to send his servant. But she declines, saying that he must go himself. And it's at that time that God reveals to him what the problem is. And he goes. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 32 through 35, um, it describes this scene of what happens next. And there are some similarities to how his mentor, Elijah, also handled um, the death of the other woman's son. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child was lying dead on his bed. So he went in, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes and his hands in his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him again. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. The woman is still not forgotten though after this miraculous event. This story is not just about hospitality and this miraculous healing. Because if it was, it would end here. But we find out that actually this woman played a long-term role in Elisha's life because several years later, um, much further in um, 2 Kings, we read that Elisha is still in contact with this woman. The story doesn't end there. 
In 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 1, we read that he warns her that there will be a famine for seven years. And he tells her to sojourn wherever she can and return after that. And when, But when she comes back, she discovers that she's lost her land due to her supposed desertion of the property. Um, here, God performs another miracle in her life for following the instructions, her continued faith and, and looking to God. Um, and she finds herself ready to plead to the king. And as she's there, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, is also there telling the king about Elisha's great exploits and his all of the deeds. Upon hearing the story of the woman, he says, and see, here is this woman where this has happened. So the king asks her, is this story true? And so she presents her son, who was living, and retells the story again. And the king is so impressed that he gives the land to her and again um, believes and recommits the Lord um, to the kingdom. The story of the Shunammite woman is often used as a lesson in contentment in doing good deeds and not expecting anything in return. Um, and this can be used as that, but I don't necessarily see her reply as fully being content. She has learned to live um, without a child and does not allow herself even the idea of that being a possibility. It does seem to mean a great deal to her when it's offered because she almost fears it as a joke. It's too much to hope for. So I don't know how content it is. Um, perhaps it's a better story on learning how to live through um, disappointments and how God still sometimes provides. Sometimes, though, I find that we don't allow ourselves to answer God's call or to make changes in our life because of the fear that comes along with it. The fear of change, the fear of disappointment that maybe it won't live up to our expectations or the loss that often comes with great blessings. Um, with great love comes great losses um, is often said. But she did still answer God's call. She still looked for daily ways to provide for others and to do good in her life, even if she wasn't fully content um, or if she was. That wasn't the point of it. It wasn't doing something to gain something, um, which you could argue that the Zephyrath woman gave her last bit because she was promised more food. But either way, it's a story of being faithful in everyday life, to accepting those hard choices and giving of ourselves when it may not seem like the normal thing to do. And then the blessings that do come along with that, that God gives us in our life, large and small. This story is probably most often associated with hospitality. In both stories, actually, the women help give food and give a place to stay to the prophets who are um, foreign in their lands. And in fact, all three of the stories that I've discussed both today and in the earlier video have very similar characteristics regarding hospitality. Um, there are at least three clear parallels. Um, hospitality, a prophecy regarding a reward, and a son and the salvation of that son. And in two cases, you have a barren woman who's given a child who is nearly lost by death, but then is saved. In one case, um, you then have the woman who has the child already, but is the child is saved. Um, and the other parallel is that there is a famine in all three stories. Abraham welcomed road-weary travelers, strangers, into his tent. And he, after paying keen attention to their needs, bathing, resting, food, things like that, 
it's after that that he receives that Abrahamic covenant that I will give you land and I will give you a son. Likewise, the Shunammite woman is given back her land and also receives a son. Um, and the Shunammite woman standing in her doorway, again, has this deep understanding and empathy for Elisha, who regularly went to Shunem on his travels. And in both cases, they focus on the needs of their visitors. And I don't think that we often look at those around us enough to, to see the need. Even perhaps more reluctantly, the widow gave all that she had to Elijah. All of these point to giving of oneself daily, of looking around and seeing this deep need, and serving God in little ways. It's not these big um, heroic stories that we so often focus on, but these stories made a difference to those heroes. It made a difference in God's story within the Bible, and they were worth mentioning. And all of these stories point towards Christ and his promise. There's a prophecy, a son, a loss, a resurrection. And this can be something that we can hold on to. That, again, God makes these promises and at the end there is this salvation and this resurrection to new life in heaven. We need to not only be faithful, even when we're tested, and need to turn to God in our greatest need, but in our daily lives, in the humdrum of everything that we're doing that doesn't seem so heroic, we do need to open our homes and our lives to those around us to look at those needs, those individual little things that are happening with those in our communities. Um, we need to be hospitable to the foreigner within our lands, just like all of these stories. We need to look at the details because that's what these women did. They looked at those who were hungry. They looked when someone needed a place to stay and they saw that and they saw and recognized God in others. And we need to do that too because we all have God in us. And when it's difficult, we need to recognize the calling that God has on our lives that we need to find the blessings and the rewards that he is giving us, whether those might have consequences or highs and lows along the way. That's part of, of the blessing. So I hope that you have learned a little something about these women who helped the great heroes um, in their travels and their battles and in their daily lives. And I want to wish all of you a happy Mother's Day this week. Um, motherhood indeed brings joys and sadness. Um, I think that, both of, that all of these stories kind of tell us and remind us what a gift it is to have children and to be a part of that promise of the future. But we also need to remember to seek God in all circumstances, to not give up hope in our struggles, and to join in the ministry daily, giving of ourselves when we can. So join me in my next video where we take the focus off of Joshua and his wall and we take a deeper look at Rahab. Please contact me in the email below with any comments or questions. And if you'd like to catch up on more faith formation videos um, from Lakewood Presbyterian Church, please check out our website or our YouTube page. Thank you and God bless.